Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Peter, and I'm one of the assistant ministers here. It's my privilege to bring you God's word. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for the rain. We give you thanks, Lord, for this gathering of your people here. Father, we pray now as we come to your word that you quieten our hearts, open our minds up to receive your instructions. Amen. One of the most precious and uh, beautiful things in the Bible is that our salvation is not depending on any good works that we've done, but it's dependent solely on God's grace and by faith in what Jesus has done for us at the cross. But it's also a truth that is misunderstood and abused. Some of us think that since we are saved by grace and not by works, it doesn't really matter what we do. We shouldn't worry about sin because at the end of the day, all is forgiven. But I think we do not understand or appreciate God's grace until we, we realize that it's not okay to continue living as though nothing's changed when we came to Christ. So this morning, we're going to pick up from last week's message, where we're told to set our minds on things above. So last week, we learned that we have died with Christ, and through his death and resurrection, Jesus has given us new life. And we are told not to set our minds on earthly things. So with that, in verse 5, Paul issues this imperative to put to death things that belong to the old ways. Note that he did not say put aside, tidy up, or hide them away. He is very direct and unambiguous. Put to death. These are very strong words. What can you think? Destroy, execute, eliminate, eradicate, do not resuscitate. It leaves no doubt in our minds the dramatic changes that we have to make to our lives. They do sound extreme, and they are extreme because we are dealing with sin here. It's not just a minor infringement or a minor judgment in error, or well, error in judgment. Sin is extremely repugnant to God. So Paul says in verse 5, Therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Paul is calling us to examine our lives and to confess any sins or worldly desires that we have not completely put to death. Perhaps they have been secretly tucked away, hidden away, and we bring them out occasionally when our evil desires or the desires of the old way take charge of our lives. The warning here is not to just hide them away. The warning here is not just to treat them like those chocolate treats that we occasionally indulge ourselves. The Bible is very clear. Sexual immorality is any sexual activity outside marriage, a marriage between a man and a woman. This includes premarital, extramarital, and homosexual relations. Sexual morality is rampant in our society today. You don't have to look very far to find that it is destroying homes. It's destroying lives. We live in a promiscuous society that is driven by sexual passions. Just think, pornography is very easily accessible. And we are distracted and we are drawn to it. But be warned, stay away from it. There are prevalent sexual symbols and messaging. They're very common in our advertising in movies. Just think of movies that you have watched recently. Very likely there would be scenes where man meets woman. 
And in a very short while, both men and women would have a passion-inspired twinkle in their eyes. And in a very short while, both end up in a bed or in an alleyway having sex. That is us. It's very subtle messaging. In fact, it's no longer subtle. It's in our face, and we are conditioned to accept that sex outside marriage is good. It's acceptable. Christians today are ridiculed and accused of living in the dark ages with our teaching on sex in marriages only. Instead, we find that society today celebrates promiscuity. Just a few weeks ago, we had the Mardi Gras. That is nothing more than just pagan promiscuity. So we need to wake up to the fact that we are being influenced by society's declining moral values and we can compromise biblical teachings. Society has desensitized us and I think that we may have gone too far to accommodate modern sensibilities. We don't like to talk about sin. It's best to avoid the topic of sin because the whole idea of sin offends our unbelieving friends. We prefer to talk about a living God. A gracious God is wonderful messaging. So in our language today, we no longer talk about people committing adultery. Instead, they have an an affair. We go along with society's notion of inclusiveness and diversity, even though it's contrary to God's definition of diversity and inclusiveness. We do not and cannot fully appreciate God's grace until we really get how offensive sin is to God. Sin has destroyed our relationship with our Creator. I'm not saying that the Bible is negative on sex. In fact, it has a very high view, the highest view on sex. So it doesn't matter whether you're young and married or have been married for a long time. The Bible teaches us that sex is a purposeful gift of God that is to be guarded and to be used only for that God-intended purpose and within marriages exclusively. The second element that Paul talks about that we have to put to death is impurity. This is more than just physical sexual immorality and just generally refers to any moral corruption or uncleanliness. Think explicit sexual imagination, explicit sexual speech and deeds are just some examples. The third element is wrongfully Uh, wrongfully directed sexual desires. In other words, lust. In the New Testament, there's only two other usage of the word lust. Paul in 1 Thessalonians refer, describe the passionate lust of Gentiles who do not know God. And in Romans, he talks about the shameful lust of homosexuality. In all these instances, they refer to sexual sins. And don't forget in Matthew 5, our Lord Jesus said that any, anyone, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Pornography is a prime example of these elements. Pornography corrupts our mind. It gives us false images about sex and intimate relationships. We have impure thoughts and lust after unrealistic intimacies. So as Paul says, put them to death. The fourth element of sensuality to put to death is evil desires. Remember in Paul's opening remarks in chapter 1, he talks about evil actions. Basically, it refers to our propensity to sin, our human nature to do evil. 
So we must honestly ask ourselves if we struggle with any of these earthly elements. Do we simply hide them away, not talk about it? Or do we earnestly seek to put them to death? The Apostle James wrote in his letter, Each one is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. That's the desire that cultivates sin. The fifth element, greed, is the inappropriate desire for more. We are not satisfied with what we have. We yearn for more. We covet for more. Desire can be more money, more power, more things. Or it can be the desire to have more sexually than what is rightfully ours. I always like to say greed. In an Australian context, if you're after a pay rise, do you know that we all earn the same amount of money? It's not enough. So greed is just desiring more than what it's God given us. Greed is idolatry, Paul says. They're very strong words. It's idolatry. It's desiring more than what is rightfully yours. It means that you are not contented with God and what he has given you. Instead of setting our minds on what is above, we set our minds on desires of earthly nature. This is idolatry, putting something before God and turning away from God. We want to be autonomous. We want to pursue our self-indulgent passions and pleasures. When I was preparing this, I thought it's ironic that Paul tells us to put to death, given that earlier he said we've already died with Christ. So how do you kill something that's already dead? While we have already died with Christ and to our old lives, we still live in an old world, a fallen world, and the old world is not yet completely destroyed. The old world with the things that belong to our earthly nature continue to exist and continue to assert its influence and distractions over us. And that's why Paul says we have to put them to death. John Woodhouse, the former principal of Moore Theological College, has this to say. He says, if I don't deal with covetousness, greed, I'm likely to be in trouble with my desires. If I don't deal with my desires, I will be in trouble with my thoughts. If I don't deal with my thoughts, then I am asking for trouble in my actions. How true is that? Right. So deal with it. In other words, this earthly desires must be dealt with, but it requires strong, decisive, and radical actions. And I think if we are honest, we have to say that we can't make these radical changes ourselves. We lack the discipline, the motivation, the willpower, and dare I say, the desire. Just think of success rates of diets and exercises, and you get my drift. But the good thing is that because we are in Christ, we have the transforming power of Christ in us. Paul says in Romans, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. In other words, the power of Christ can transform us by renewing our minds. As we let Christ transform us, we set our life compasses on things above, on our biblical teachings, instead of societal cultures and sensibilities. 
And if that approach doesn't work, the reminder of God's truth doesn't work, then Paul reminds us of the stick in verse 6. Verse 6 says, Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. God's wrath is his righteous anger against sin. God is holy and cannot tolerate sin. God's wrath is coming and will culminate in his judgment against sin. The heart of the gospel of Christ is the forgiveness of sin. Because Christ has reconciled us to God and made peace through his blood on a cross, we do not fear God's wrath. God's wrath is not coming on us because in Christ we have abandoned the old ways that was bringing his wrath on us. So let me ask everyone here, do we need any more excuses not to put to death these earthly desires? In verse 8, Paul returns to his theme, but with a slight shift. Instead of saying putting to death, he now says put away. (laughs) He moves from personal integrity and personal conduct to interpersonal relationships and things that can damage our relationships and disrupt the community. Paul starts by using the metaphor of clothes. Take off your old clothes. Don't wear them anymore. The old clothes are disgusting. Throw them away and put on the new clothes that God has given us. When I read this, I had a chuckled to myself because I'm old, funny dada. I look at clothes of the young people and it's like, they're disgusting, they should be thrown away. <laughs> right. But they're expensive and they look good. <laughs> but this is not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the new life in Christ, completely new that Christ has given us. We have this new life. And what is Paul saying here? The world today believes that We have the right to be angry if we think that we have been wronged. Just look at the number of angry comments in newspapers or angry posts in social media. We believe that it's our right to vent our anger and we just don't hold back. We are quick to provide our opinions even when it's not asked. And we usually provide very disgusted opinions. But do you see the irony here again? The very people who have brought the wrath of God to the world think that they have the right to be angry. So we need to put aside these anger-driven emotions and not fly off the handle at a drop of a pin. Malice, as Paul continues, is hurtful and nasty. Do we embellish our speech with malicious insinuations so that we can increase the number of our likes in our social media postings? Slander is making false accusations, defaming and destroying the reputation of others. It could just be a few words, But how much juicier would our comments and gossip be if we slip in a bit of slander? Malice and slander could be just simple words that we tag on to our conversations or when we give our unsubstantiated opinions. We may think they are funny, we may think they are harmless, but they are hurtful and they can humiliate. So we must discipline ourselves and get rid of anger, malice, and slander from our speech. Filthy language is disgraceful speech punctuated with obscenity. Again, in today's world, we may be accustomed to hearing them or using them ourselves. We have become desensitized to crude and obscene language, but that doesn't make it right or acceptable. 
The Apostle James again tells us that the tongue is like a fire. It is restless, full of deadly poison, and must be tamed. Malicious and slanderous speech driven by our self-righteous anger would be like a fire that will burn uncontrollably. So we've got to ask ourselves, are our speech fueling the fire that is raging, or do we seek to extinguish the fires? If you have died with Christ, you must put away such damaging speech and let the power of Christ transform you, change what is coming out of our mouths. And from verse 9, Paul now addresses the corporate body of Christ. Verse 9, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the creator. Paul here is addressing the assembly of united individuals. Because we have the new life, the language spoken must be that of truth. Individually, we are members and parts of the body of Christ. Individually, we have put off our old self and put on the new self. Our conduct, our actions, and our speech reflect Christ in us. Paul puts in another way in Ephesians. Paul says, take off your former self, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. There is renewal taking place. As we set our minds on things above, we are being renewed. And this leads to us being increasingly restored until Christ is fully revealed in glory. So it's only by God's grace that we are saved, that we are given new life. And it's this beautiful truth that binds us together as a body of Christ's united individuals. So the things that we must put away or put to death are precisely the sins that destroy not only our personal integrity, but our community spirit and the harmony of the, bi of the body. Do not lie. So don't let anyone tell you that greed, evil desire, lust, or sexual immorality doesn't matter. It's an outright lie. Don't let anyone deny or water down the impending judgment, the impending wrath of God. Call out the lie if anyone tells you it's okay to be angry. And malice, slander, and obscene language are just simply part and parcel of our modern language. The body of Christ, the new humanity, is defined by a single entity, Christ and Christ alone. So as we genuinely seek Christ and seek to please him, we will discover possibilities of real fellowship with one another. It's Christ that binds us together. Verse 11 tells us, In Christ there is not Greek or Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Isn't that wonderful? There is no racial or ethnic discrimination. There is no social, geographical, or economic differentiation. In biblical times, Greeks regarded anyone who is not Greek as barbarians. And the Scythians are the worst and the lowest of the lowest. So today, in Christ, it doesn't really matter who we are. It doesn't matter whether you're Caucasian or Asian, black or white. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. And it doesn't even matter if you're a Westie or have come from Mount Druid and have climbed Mount Druid. <laughs> right. In the Christian community, earthly differentiators 
are irrelevant. We are united together. It's only Christ that matters. Christ is all and in all. He is the center of everything. He is the center of creation. He is the center of redemption. Christ unites all because he dwells in us all. And we make up the new community. This, my friends, is true diversity and inclusiveness. This inclusiveness in diversity is in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. Remember Paul's prayer at the beginning of the letter of Colossians? Let me read to you from chapter 1, verse 9. Paul prayed that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. This is setting our minds on things above. This is the new life in Christ. This is the prayer that we should be praying for ourselves and for each other. All that matters to belong to this new life, to have this new life, is that we have repented of our sins we have received Christ as Lord and Savior. We have died with him and we have been raised up by him. It's only by God's grace and true Christ that our sins are forgiven. If you have not experienced this new life, please don't put it off any longer. Look to Christ and enjoy the benefits of the new life. I started by saying the unbelieving world thinks that we Christians are out of step with modern sensibilities. We are called dinosaurs. The world thinks that it's absurd that we maintain God's commands and standards to exercise his gift of sex exclusively in marriages and uphold the powerful goodness of sex in its God's designed context. Christian views and teachings are viewed as archaic and irrelevant. Instead, the world continues in their self-indulgent and idolatrous ways and disastrously ignore God. Imagine us living as a community of like-minded believers. Imagine if our lives were consistent with biblical teachings. Our lives are lives that have been set our mindset on things on earth and our conduct and our actions reflect this new life. As the community in Christ, our speech is not for putting others down, not for expressing our frustrations and annoyance in anger, not for lashing out in rage, not for embellishing our speech with slander or malice, and not laced with filthy language. Instead, our speech and new life are synonymous with building up and encouragement, comfort, kindness, and compassion. And critically, it's for turning attention away from ourselves and to Christ and his glory instead. What would the world think of us then? Would the world still think that we are mad and irrelevant? Probably, I would say. But I would say that the unbelieving world would actually be amazed and sit up and acknowledge that Christians do have the real thing, the real hope in Jesus. Christ is all and in all. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks for you, our God. We give you thanks for Jesus. We give you thanks that through him and by him, you have given us this new life. Help us, O Lord, to set our minds on things above. Help us, Lord, to live this new life that you've given us the way that you expect us to live. Amen.